my wife leaned over and said, start getting up. <laughs> and then as I got up, she said, and be concise today. Let's have a round of applause for all those that agree with that. <laughs> See, you're the only one that don't like my preaching. <laughs> the passages that were read um, in the communion service are three of my four favorite passages. I have a very close friend in... Uh, College Station, named Mary, who is a delightful lady, and I always think of her when I think of Mary that ran to the tomb, and it's surprising to me that something was going on there because they didn't recognize Jesus immediately. You remember on the road to Emmaus, see? walked with him for a while before they realized who he was. Uh, he had been changed in, in, some, in some way, or it was just so completely out of the realm of possibility that that could be him that they just didn't recognize him. But that passage there in... in uh, 19, I believe it was, when uh, Mary is talking to Jesus, not realizing she's talking to Jesus, and he just has that one sentence with one word in there, Mary. And then she knew. I, that's, a, that's a spine tingler right there, for sure. Mary. So I uh, appreciated those uh, communion thoughts. And you all do a great job of that, by the way. All you that get up here and share communion thoughts, you can tell it's thoughtful. And uh, I, it makes it more meaningful when... And there's nothing wrong with reading the same old verse every Sunday, but, you know, usually we just read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and kind of did communion and went on. But it's nice to, to witness the thoughtfulness that goes into it. What was it that Adam and Eve needed as they considered the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? They could see the tree, and God had made the choice very clear to them. I don't know how much they knew about death, because no one around them had died yet. I, you would think they would reason, well, if I'm alive, and death is something different, then it must not be what I am right now. <laughs> but trying to conceptualize the idea of death and being banished from the garden. What they needed was engagement. They needed to have truly uh, engaged the Word of God, to have taken the word of God at its word and embraced it and engaged it. It's kind of like at a when I do weddings and you've got these two young people standing there. Usually the weddings I did in College Station were all, you know, 22, 23, 24-year-old college students who just graduated and decided on a date. And they stand there under a tree or if they want to really punish you, they have it in the middle of August outside somewhere, which I've never understood. Uh, and, and you're doing their vows, and they're saying, yes, I promise to honor and pledge myself 
and they're saying for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And there's not an engagement in their mind about any of those words at that moment in their lives, right? It's just something we say and kind of in the back of our mind, well, hopefully that couple will have those problems, but we sure won't. And so when we hear God's word, we have to embrace them for what they are. God's word. No matter to whom it's speaking or in what context it's speaking, somewhere along the lines, along the line, Adam and Eve just didn't, cr didn't quite grasp the significance of what it was that God had said. If you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. And they ended up getting banished from the garden. And it was probably at that moment that they were really engaged with the former words that they had heard from God. Like, God forbid some of us should hear at some day as eternity begins, depart from me, I never knew you. All of a sudden, all of those words of God, all of those communion things that we've taken, all those songs that we've sing, all these fine sermons that we've listened to are going to boil back through our minds and we're going to say, why didn't I engage it? And there's a lots, there are lots of stories uh, about that in Peter. Let me make sure that I got this. Now, there we go. At one time in Jesus' life, Peter was called Satan by Christ. You think, think that got his attention? Said, I'll, I'll go with you anywhere. Jesus turned to him and said, call him Satan. I'll bet you that cut right to the heart of Peter. And maybe then at Pentecost, it really caught up with him when he actually got to stand in front of all of those Jews and, and preach the first gospel sermon about the resurrected Jesus. Maybe then he was truly engaged in what he was doing. Maybe he was truly engaged in having faith in God, because that's all we're really talking about. I just use engagement because faith is used a lot. So this idea of engagement is buying into something. Have, I don't know if, if you're Aggie fans here or not. Apparently not. But I like to watch uh, Jimbo's pregame and halftime interaction with his players. Makes me want to go play for him. Those players seem to be engaged with Jimbo. And they want to get out there and do their best. I can't flash off all the words real fast like he does it all the time. Of course, he's done it for 40 years. But engagement is really the key to our lives with God. And it means engaged in little things. When we, should, when we think about saying something that we shouldn't say, if we're truly engaged with God, we, we stop ourselves and think. Just for a moment, we, like Mary at the tomb, when she went in, and she said, they took his body away. And then Jesus says, Mary, maybe like that, Mary. And then she realizes it. And then she's engaged. 
It's that process in our life when, when we have to believe something that maybe deep down we really don't believe. Or maybe deep down it's just so hard to grasp that we just can't quite fathom it. Have you thought about uh, what it's really going to be like in heaven? You tried to imagine that? And Peter says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Now that's all the Bible says about it, and we can speculate and about it, but the truth of the matter is Peter just says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Well, what that's, what's that going to be like? Is it going to be another Garden of Eden? Are we going to get to start over? We won't, won't, one good thing is there won't be a tree of knowledge of good and evil there, so I won't have to worry about that. So there's all kinds of things uh, to imagine, to grasp by faith because we really can't see it. And so with all that said, and we add this new word to our other three words, tension, struggle, timing, and now we add engagement. And we come to the life of Abraham. Oh, I went backwards. Pete, repeat. Pete, repeat. Abraham lived in the Mesopotamian River Valley. I noticed this uh, little thing they gave me today has a... a uh, marker on it. And I wish I had a map to show you of the Mesopotamian River Valley. You could probably look at one in the back of your Bibles. Pretend that's the world as Abraham knew it, and the Mesopotamian River Valley runs over here off of the Persian Gulf, and the Euphrates runs up about this high, and then it, or the Tigris and the Euphrates both empty out into the Persian Gulf. And they carry on up here about this far, and then the Persian Gulf runs up this direction, and the Euphrates River runs up this direction all the way over to what? Almost to the Mediterranean Sea. And when you go, it's a miracle! <laughs> so if I can. Find everything. Here's the Persian Gulf. I'm not going to last near as long as I thought I was here. So the Persian Gulf last is right here. And the Tigris and Euphrates run, getting better. It runs, runs right up. This is the Tigris, runs right up there. And then the Euphrates runs right up there. And Ur, right there, is where Abraham was from. This, this was the king's highway that ran from Mesopotamian River Valley, all the way up into Haran, down along the Mediterranean coast, clear into Egypt. It's called the King's Highway. 1,500 miles. And that's Abraham's journey. That's how far he had to drive his sedan all the way up and all the way down to there. Well, ultimately down to there because that's where his uh, in-laws, where his in-laws ended up. And this was God's heritage. This was God's plan for Abraham.
And God promised Abraham when he was 75 years old, you're going to have a son. Now, if, if you were God and you were going to give Abraham a son, how long would you make him wait? I'd give him about nine months. God made him, God made him wait 75 years until he was born. Now you talk about tension and struggle and timing. And we're going to get to this story in the middle of it. Sarah and Abraham pull a Tower of Babel out of their pocket. Remember when Tower of Babel decided they were going to build their own building and do their own thing? Well, they pull a Tower of Babel out of their pocket, and his name was Ishmael. They'd waited a long time already for this son. So they got together and they made their plan. They used their human reason and they made this plan. They'd say, well, uh, why don't we just have, I'll just have a son with, with uh, Hagar and we'll name him Ishmael. And at one point, I believe it's in Genesis 17, God holds Ishmael up toward God, or Abraham holds Ishmael up toward God and says, listen to these words. His human words, if, if only Ishmael could live under your blessing. Had his own ideas, see? Abraham was engaged, but he wasn't fully engaged in what it was that God was about. And I'm wondering, and it's probably true, why that takes so long for God to bring us around sometime. Because we're not the ones that are fully engaged, fully ready, for example, to be baptized, to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to come to him and say, I'm yours. Finally, I'm yours. Maybe that's not why we're prone to repentance and and confession on a regular basis because we're really not engaged yet. How much confession really goes on among Christians? How long has it been since? I don't, not any particular you, but how, how long has it been since you've you just bowed your knee to another and said, I've got some things I need to confess to you. That's what God wants from us. He wants engagement. Abraham needed God. He needed God because ultimately the passages that we read in the New Testament God was going to bring Jesus into the world. Now look at that. Look at that. Talk about timing. And there's all sorts of theories on how far, how many years went by from Genesis to Matthew. But it was that long. Before Matthew was, Jesus was born. That long. Hundreds, thousands of years. Now why would God take so long? Well, that's his timing. Galatians chapter 3, three says, at just the right time, Jesus was born born under the law, born of a woman, at just the right time. AD 33 was just the right time. That was God's timing. And the struggle in Abraham's life and the tension in Abraham's life 
What about the Apostle Paul? It seems like if God wanted to get Paul to start preaching for him, all he would have to do from a human standpoint is show up on a cherubim. Fly down on a cherubim. And jump off of the cherubim, tie him to a tree so he wouldn't run off, and sit down by Saul and say, Saul, I need you. And surely by then he would have had Saul's attention. He could have said, Saul, I need you to be the priest of the Gentiles. You ready? But God did it different. God's way of doing things is different. He appeared to him, Jesus appeared to him from the sky. And he said, Saul, Saul, this is Acts 22, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul was a Gentile, he was a Roman citizen, he was, he was politically connected to get the papers that he needed to kill Christians. He did kill Christians. He held Stephen's clothes in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen was uh, uh, stoned to death. But God needed Paul's engagement. There's other stories in the Bible where God doesn't have to chase after someone. They chase after him like Zacchaeus. The wee little man was he. Climbed up in the sycamore tree to save your four see. He was ready. For whatever reason, for whatever circumstance, he was ready. God needs us to be barren before him. To be stripped naked. To be wide open. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, probably the foundational statement of all of our relationship with God, blessed are the poor in spirit. A broken spirit. Like that horse that, I've never done a lot with horses, but that wild horse that's finally broken. The bronc gets on him and rides him until he, his spirit breaks. His fight back breaks. And you can put a saddle on him and ride him. Poor in spirit. That was missing with Adam and Eve when they were thinking about how good the food would taste and how it would make them equal with God. At Shinar, the Tower of Abel, there was no barrenness there, which creates engagement. They were interested in technology and in fame, making a name for themselves. In Noah's day, God says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There's no barrenness there. Hence, there's no engagement. No one knew if I'm getting there. No one knew when Abraham, when God called Abraham, that every nation on earth will be, would be blessed through him. No one knew that. And what's interesting, this, something, something may interest me, it doesn't interest you. But if you read that passage in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 to 12, see, while the world is going on, there's a, whole no, there's a whole other dimension going on out there. 
Because God not only created things visible, but invisible. And I'm assuming that the, what's going on out there is made up with God and the angels that he created who lived under the same obligation to trust God that we do because in, in, in Jude, verse 8, the Bible says that the angels that didn't obey God were bound in everlasting chains. So apparently they had choices too. But in... Uh, this passage, 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, Peter is writing later, you know, in his portion of Scripture. But he's, and he's talking about the salvation that comes from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Concerning this salvation, the prophets... Now he's talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, you know, all the rest. Spoke of the grace that was to come. They searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Christ, the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. So when Isaiah wrote Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, he was wondering, what is going on here? When is this going to happen? That's an amazing thought to me that they... They were watching God's movement in the heavenlies and watching the, move, the movement of God in the world. And they, they didn't know about Jesus, but they knew something was coming. And they were searching intently. I don't know whether they went to the library or got on the net or how they, how they did it but they were looking for some way to figure out when all of this was going to take place. So then in Galatians chapter 3, when Jesus finally arrives, the Bible says, at just the right time, Jesus was born, born under the law, born of a woman, born under law, just at the right time. Engagement begins with barrenness. You remember when you were baptized? Nobody in here does? You three people? The rest of you have completely lost your minds. Can't remember when you were baptized. I remember when I was baptized, June, I don't remember the, the day, 1963. I was at the Lubbock Christian College Youth Summer Youth Lectureship. College student named Bruce Simmer did a sermon of which I have no memory. When he got through, I went forward, as we say. And those moments are baked in my mind, and I confessed the greatest sin that I had committed. I was 13 years old. We had a drugstore downtown, Raton Drugstore. I was raised in Raton, New Mexico. And you could get a flat enchilada and a Coke for 50 cents. And I went in there one day for lunch, and good Christian boy. And there was a man sitting next to me that had just finished his enchilada plate in his Coke. And he just slid his 50 cent piece underneath the corner of his plate. What would you be thinking? I see one lady out there thinking, I'm going to get that 50 cent. I reached under there and took his 50-cent piece and slid it 
over underneath my plate and got up and left. Stole it. I stole it. I don't know who she thought paid for his. I guess she thought he stiffed it. I still had my 50 cent piece, but the 50 cent piece is under my plate. I walked all the way back to school. You'd have thought I had just murdered the vice principal. And I got to school, and Daryl Red was standing on the steps. Now, here's the human reason. I said, does anybody want 50 cents? And Daryl said, I do, and I pulled it out and threw it to him as fast as I could get rid of it. When Bruce Simmer baptized me that night, that was on my mind. 50 cents. And I believe that that was because all my life, from, from Lucille Zuber, who taught me in grade school in Rat Tone, in Bible class, to Travis Looper, who stood before the church one Sunday morning, and he'd been, he was preaching on dancing. For those of you that are younger, we used to preach against that. And one of the high school girls came forward to confess that she had gone to the prom the night before, which was a big sin at that period in time. Maybe still should be, I don't know. And she sat down on the front row and she said, I, I hope Rissy's dead because I've told this story all over Texas. Uh, well, I shouldn't say I hope she's dead. You know? uh, she confessed her sin of dancing. And you know what that preacher said? He said, I haven't been preaching on dancing lately because I've been dancing too. So our response to God begins with our barrenness. When we don't recognize Jesus. When we're not real sure God can bring a son along when I'm 75 years old and my wife is barren. And when I'm an angel in heaven and I'm watching what God is doing in heaven and on earth and I just can't make any sense of this program he's developed. Or when I'm walking through life and I get a diagnosis that I don't want. And God just says, I, I want you to bear yourself to me. And trust me. And lean on me. And a thousand verses come boiling through. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give us unto you. Not like the world giveth, give I unto you. Let, your, let, let, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you where I am, there you may be also. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He, re, he restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. My cup runs over. That's engagement. It's not perfect engagement, because we don't have perfect in them. We don't have perfect here, but it is engagement. And it says to God, I don't care if it takes however long it took from the promise to Jesus, I'm with you. And I don't care on occasion if you have to turn to me and call me Satan, I'm with you. And if I have to see the 
holes in your hands and the holes in your side, I'm with you, even though it's too hard to believe you're still alive, Thomas would say. I got to see those holes. But I'm with you, Lord Jesus. That's our calling. To be with him. To hang in there. Tie a knot and hang on. Till you find out what it is God is doing. Because that's all we've got, folks. That's all we've got. And it's enough to get us from here to yonder while we stand and sing.